So welcome everyone to this session. I'm Niklas Markman from Lund, Sweden. And once again, I'm extremely grateful and honored to have been invited here. And the hospitality of the organizers has been just amazing. So I don't see Tarek Khan here, but it's been particularly helpful in, in having me here. So I learned so much. Um, I will talk about neurocritical care of severe pediatric TBI and focus on, on the ICP management, basically how we do it. So first, a little bit of, of Sweden. We are really a high income, high resource country, small country far north, um, 10.5 million inhabitants, uh, but only six neurosurgical departments spread out through the country. You see some arrows there, the one furthest north is where I grew up, extremely cold in winter. But then I moved to Uppsala where I'm still a professor and where I had my neurosurgical training. And now I'm down south um, <clears throat> where I became the professor three years ago in Lund University. Um, we have our set of problems in Sweden. We have limited number of nurses. We had the fewest hospital beds in, in Europe, I think, per capita. And we have quite long waiting lists for elective surgery. But still, having heard these discussions, we're ext extremely happy that, that healthcare is basically free for everyone. Uh, and we have extreme, extremely easy to get toys for, for our neurocritical care. So ICP measurement is, uh, is, is um, being performed um, very liberally. So we have a safe and relatively good country Excellent roads, helmets are very widely used, particularly in kids, a good car safety, very little abuse uh, um, in Sweden, so that, that's a good point. Still, mild TBI is very common in pediatrics. We have this number, 108 per 100,000 people per year, so we see a lot of kids in the emergency room. Fortunately, very few of them are severe. And in Lund, we cover about 2 million people for neurosurgery, the whole southern region, but we only see about 10 severe TBI uh, per year, which is a good thing. And one uh, important mes uh, message and take home message is that the kids are not little adults, not only the brain or head body ratio, as you see in this image, but also with the uh, physiology. Just for spine, by mechanical maturation, start to resemble the adult spine only after age eight to nine. Cerebral blood, cerebral blood flow is lowest at birth in neonates. Then it peaks and becomes higher than the adult setting at the age of three to seven, and then decreased to adult levels. And the mean arterial blood pressure is obviously much lower than in the adults. We, you, you can have an estimate 1.5 times age, plus 55, you have an estimate. So that means young kids have pretty low mean arterial blood pressure, which of course comes to account when we talk about the cere cerebral perfusion pressure. And as we heard in severe pediatric TBI, diffuse injuries are much more common than focal ones. So it's a different entity, basically. This is a very good review by Tony Vigaggi, recently published, if we really want to look, uh, look into that. We heard so much about ICP here, won't say much about it, but high ICP is bad, of course, bad prognosis. If you can lower it, maybe the prognosis becomes better. If it becomes very high, you get microcirculatory compromise and it's obviously bad for your brain. And also we heard many times, it's basically from the adults, I think from the Lancet Neurology paper, that if you, we have protocols for your patient, that will improve outcome. Avoid the solo players, have each one in the unit adhere to certain protocols, certain rules, how to treat these patients. That's particularly important for pediatric uh, patients. And there's also one other take home message, it's maybe difficult or even dangerous to extrapolate what we do in adult TBI to pediatric TBI. We often do that because of lack of evidence, but it's still something we should, should consider. Uh, these guidelines were recently published. They're very good. They will mention a few of the potential measures we can use for ICP control. And you can have various measures, the various um, second tier therapies that you can choose. The question is always, what do we choose? And what's the basic setup for, for our um, pediatric TBI patients? So just illustrated by, by case, 11 year old girl, girl, 35 kilo, horseback riding is very popular in Sweden. She's found unconscious and unresponsive, equal pupils, maybe a little slowly reacting on the scene of the accident. She's GCS five and she's intubated, <clears throat> no additional other injuries. So she's taken to our neurosurgical department, of course. Um, initial CT scan, right pupil now somewhat larger than the left, nothing to decompress really. You see the open basal cisterns, so um, there was a primary hospital that comes to us. We very frequently do repeat CT scans, even in kids, because this is a severe severity of the injury. So we decided to do a monitor. Nothing really had happened between these two scans. 
So we place a Spiegelberg monitor, which can measure both the interventricular pressure and the interparenchymatous um, pressure and the like of so brain tissue oxygenation. As you see, we have um, a lot of toys. We didn't put microdialysis in this kid. We always do that in the adults. We had some issues. ICP was increased <clears throat> during the night. We used today, so we used the LAN protocol that, would, <clears throat> that I will address uh, shortly, increasing dose of barbiturates. ICP frequently at 20 to 30, a CBP around 50, like of readings around 50. No disaster, but no, we're not happy really. <clears throat> so during the day, still problems and decision to, to start by changing the ICP monitor because we didn't really trust this ICP. We still had open basal cisterns. But we learned, we saw a previous presentation here that ICP can actually be high even though the basal cisterns are open. So it's absolutely CT correlates with ICP if they are compressed, if you have midline shift, et cetera, but you cannot really trust an open cistern and say the ICP is normal. So, well, so we put um, the consultant in charge. This was not my case. He um, placed a regularly external ventricular drain drainage and in the OR ICP was climbing. It was just there, just there observing 12, 16, 20, 25, 30. So we, now we had a problem. So now in pediatric TBI, what's our so treatment strategy, our choices, ICP lowering measures. And first we go back to the guidelines, ICP and CPP. For ICP, it basically states that you should treat an ICP over 20, the same, same as in adults, basically, even though they say 22. So that's one good thing. For CPP, you should acknowledge this sentence. There are age specific thresholds for CPP with a range to 40 to 50, that means it's lower than it is for, for adults, with infants being at the lower range and adolescents at the upper range, uh, upper end of, the, of this range. That means that they will probably tolerate a lower uh, CPP than adults do. And in, in Lund, we adopt the Lund concept, started by these very bright colleagues, um, Karl Henrik Nordström, neurosurgeon, is now retired, but will again, the um, uh, physiologist and anesthesiologist also retired. They came up with a theoretical concept that in the injured brain, particularly in the diffuse brain, you have a leaky blood-brain barrier, you have leaky vessels. That meaning to avoid the increased brain edema, you should, let's see, this is the pointer. Huh? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. First that and then that, okay, right. That means that if you want to reduce water going out from the vessels into the injured brain, you need to um, increase the colloid osmotic pressure within the vessels. And also it could be a good idea to actually lower the blood pressure by also reducing CPP. It was a new thinking at that time 25 years ago, also evaluated now a couple of years ago. So but the basic for this, we use anti-hypertensive treatment and we use stress reduction with beta blockers and alpha-2 agonist, which is clonidine that we use. We try to avoid the vasopressors such as norepinephrine. We were very really liberal to use albumin. We liberally transfused this patient and provided him a globin count of 11 or higher. And in adults, we accept CPP down to 50. So that's a sort of basic thing. Reduce blood pressure, accept a lower CPP. And we use brain tissue oxygenation to be sure that the brain can tolerate such a low CPP. In kids, we can go even further down and accept as low as 40 for CPP. And this is sort of our roadmap, our cookbook or whatever you want to call it, that we use for the residents to have the protocol 24 seven. What can you do if you have the problems? The ICP goes up 20, 25. Of course, you always consider surgery, decompression, et cetera. And we have the EVD for CSF drainage. We can increase sedation, including barbiturates, which is, I think is particularly useful in kids, and et cetera, et cetera. But also, we not only address ICP, we also address CPP. If it gets too low, we get in concern. The brain tissue oxygenation gets too low. We have, of course, various steps to avoid too low CPP. Um, the thing with Lund concept, I think theoretically it's very um, interesting and it has very good physiological aspects. Not so much data on it, both for adults and pediatrics. This is now from 2005, pediatric series of 71 patients from Umeå, that's north of Sweden, using the loan concept with a good outcome. And this is our own data from a 
nine-year series. We haven't really published that yet. We're still trying to get to find the outcome of a few missing patients. But as you can see, the outcome for severe TBI in kids is a pretty good, 28 with a good outcome. Okay, oh, 10 minutes already, sorry. Okay, speed up. So what other options do we have? Hyperventilation um, should be avoided for, for routine measures. We can use it for, for um, emergencies. CSF drainage, obviously, if you don't have so much mass effect, that can be used to, to reduce um, uh, sorry, the GPUs ICP. Barbiturates, extremely good in, in pediatrics. I've used it many times. Barbiturate coma requires a lot of experience, but it can also kill patients. You need to be able to monitor this systemically as electrolyte disturbances, et cetera. But it's actually very good for ICP control and the diffuse uh, pediatric TBIs. So that's, that's a good choice. Um, decompressor chronectomy, I didn't plan to say much because there was a previous speaker, but then it didn't turn up. But this is obviously an option also for kids even though, same for adults, we need to consider the underlying severity, the potential of devastating outcomes, et cetera. But it's really good for ICP control and can really save lives. This would be a slide from, from the guidelines, sort of how to adopt it. There were various um, tools you may use to control ICP in, in kids. It's very good to look into. This particular patient was a young consultant who was standing there with an ICP escalating out of control. So we actually decided to decompress the patients. And if it had been me, I think it would have been an option to provide more barbiturates or even barbiturate coma, including CSF drainage, but this was his decision. And I can understand it in view of the sort of emergent situation he had. So with a pretty good recovery, it's a moderate to severe uh, outcome, I would say. She has, she can be in school with a lot of aid and some cognitive deficits. Take home message, uh, kids are not little adults. The loan concept that we use is a, is, a, is a theory, basically. It seemed to be um, beneficial to use in kids. Um, I think it's, it's attractive because of the diffuse nature of, of uh, TBI in kids. And it should be considered as a concept, not particular ones, not to discuss the albumin or the hemoglobin. It's more a concept of way of thinking. And most importantly, same for, for pediatrics, establish protocols for, for, for these severely injured kids and for everyone to use, and they'll uh, absolutely improve the outcome for, for them. Before I in, um, end, in two days, uh, we have the Nordic Neurotrauma Meeting. I understand you cannot come. Instead, mark your calendars for next year, December 10 to 11, the third ENS Trauma and Update, uh, the ENS Trauma and Critical Care Update Meeting. It's so new, I've decided this last week, I haven't got a web page yet. But to, so mark your calendars, check out the news, and we uh, wish you very, uh, very welcome to Lund next year. Thank you.